Hello, I'm Barry Kern, CEO of Kern Studios and Mardi Gras World. For over 90 years, my family's been bringing Mardi Gras to the world. We're proud to sponsor the historic New Orleans Collection's new exhibition, Making Mardi Gras. This exhibition and programs celebrate the artists and makers who make Mardi Gras so spectacular. Enjoy the program and happy Mardi Gras. Today's session takes us behind the scenes of Mardi Gras' more exclusive side, the masked balls that fill the social calendars of New Orleans residents throughout the carnival season. I'm joined by historians Errol Laborde, Frank Perez, and Tracy Thibodeau, the president of the original Illinois Club. We discuss the traditions and similarities of the old line crew balls, gay balls, and traditional black debutante balls. Enjoy the program. Welcome to the Historic New Orleans Collection, Making Mardi Gras Symposium. I'm your host, Arthur Hardy. I publish the Mardi Gras Guide and provide carnival coverage for uh, Fox A TV, WWL Radio, and the Advocate Times for I have a distinguished guest of panelists with us, starting with uh, Frank Perez. Frank serves as the executive director of the LGBT Archives Project. He's authored several books on New Orleans queer history and is also founder and the captain of the Coup de la Rue. Let me say that again, Captain of the Coup de la Rue Royal Revelers. Tracy Thibodeau is also with us. He was born in Thibodeau, educated in New Orleans at St. Aug High School and Billard University, where he earned a BA and BMA degrees. He taught high school in both New Orleans and Jefferson parishes. He's been retired for 12 years. He's been a member of the original Illinois Club since 1993. Uh, his father was an Illinois Club member, and his son is currently a member. He loved to hunt and fish and talk about Mardi Gras. And finally, Errol Laborde, editor and publisher of New Orleans Magazine and Louisiana Life Magazine. I could read his whole resume, but we all know who he is. He's an award-winning journalist and has uh, written uh, quite a few books on Mardi Gras and Tom. So welcome, everybody. We're going to talk about carnival balls today. You know, Mardi Gras separated, in my mind, into two different categories, the public celebration, the parades that everybody can go to, and then the private side, carnival balls which are by invitation only, though today you can buy tickets to some of the uh, super crew events. And I guess we're going to start off with uh, Errol going to ask you, what the heck is a ball? For those people who don't know, what is a ball? Well, first, not all balls are necessarily carnival balls. Uh, you know, a ball is a big celebration, usually with a, uh, with a dance and with music and, and some form of a, a formality to it. Now, there are some people who go out and boil crawfish and say, we're having a ball too, okay? But in terms of the ball, as, as we use it the most, usually I think the identifying elements would be a bit of elegance to it, a bit of music, a bit of a, a, a bit of a dance. But then once carnival got rolling, and then you start seeing the emergence of the, um, of the, of the carnival ball. Uh, first with Comus uh, in 1857, and then uh, by 1870, you saw the Twelfth Night Revelers, and then 1873, uh, uh, you saw Rex, and it's been a, a spiral since then. Errol, uh, talk a little bit about the, the role of royalty in, in balls. That there's a certain aspect of that that uh, every ball seems to share, right? Well, I think once the balls become, became more formal and they had the idea of the cotillion, and once they were tied in with Mardi Gras, if you had a king, I mean, why don't we do something with the people that were there? And so the idea of the, of, of the queen um, emerged. And so in the early balls, the queen was not necessarily someone who is uh, a debutante. Uh, there's this famous story of, the, of the, uh, the woman who was the first queen of the Repsol organization who was uh, uh, married to one of the members. The members was a very prominent uh, member who had been in the diplomatic corps. And uh, uh, Fannie Mae Hewitt was, the, uh, was her name. And so she wasn't a debutante, but she was just selected to be queen. And it wasn't a random thing. I mean, it was something uh, that they knew. But over time, once it became tied in with the debutante tradition more, then one of the, the, the debutantes became the queen, and then you had the maids, and so it became to be a big, uh, a big thing. I guess ceremonially, uh, uh, the most interesting method was once Twelfth Night Revelers started, that Twelfth Night Revelers, which always had its ball on Twelfth Night, used the idea of the king cake, and they had this big ceremonial king cake, I think it was made out of plywood, but, but it went... And they would roll it in, and they'd have the slices, and, the, and then the debutantes would, would, would pick the slices, and the one with the gold bean. Of course, this was also uh, prearranged to become the queen. And so this idea of <coughs> tying in the king cake with royalty 
um, you saw originating right there. And the whole idea of the ceremonial aspect, the ceremonial aspect of it, excuse me, is really kind of a knockoff on European European aristocracy, right? I mean, you have kings and queens and ladies in waiting, courts and all. Um, I guess that that came from the Parisian example, but uh, it seems that every ball kind of follows that, that, or most balls kind of follow that format where the uh, royalty is introduced. You know, over the years, balls have been held at so many different venues. I, I was looking at a book by uh, Rosary O'Neill, and uh, she says there was a theater called the St. Philip Theater, it opened in 1792. I mean, the 1700s, there was a venue for balls. She also tells us by 1840, there were 80 ballrooms in the walls, and they functioned year round. You, you mentioned about the carnival aspect, but this was a city that really enjoyed uh, staging uh, balls. And uh, the different venues over the years. I mean, we all know about the, the, the historic French Opera House that burned in 1919, and, and that was the center of Creole culture in New Orleans. But uh, there were other ball the Athenaeum, the St. Charles Theater, the Academy of Music, and most of us growing up remember the Municipal Auditorium, which was home of carnival balls. Uh, I think a record 72 balls in the 19, maybe 72, 73. Um, and of course, it was also a home of many of our graduations and the Shrine Circus and a million other things. Sadly, that building right now is not in use. We hope it, it will come back. But uh, I've often wondered, did the balls get bigger because the venues allowed for that? Or was it the other way around? Errol, you've always talked about the auditorium was designed with carnival balls in mind, right? When it opened over and up. over, you see examples of buildings that came up that people saw an opportunity there for Carnival, and then they created a new opportunity. Um, yeah, with the opening of the uh, Municipal Auditorium, the big thing about that is you could have two balls simultaneously. Uh, there were actually two ballrooms in there. And there was a time when that was going on all during Carnival. And so, yeah, when you had 72 Carnival balls, that could have been over 36 nights until that you had it. And then they handed over, uh, uh, the floors were spacious, and so, and so the... Uh, uh, the queens and the maids could walk and show off their gowns to the fullest. And so in, in terms of sight lines and visibility, that was the best place ever uh, that there's ever been for Mardi Gras. A hotel has certain luxuries, but, they, but no hotel uh, ballroom has a sight line. But look, if you go through time, um, when, the, uh, when the Rivergate opened, which was a forerunner to the convention center, you know, some people said, well, look, we, we, we're, big, we, we're building this big convention center, why don't we put high doors in there and make it wide? We could actually put a parade in there. And it was actually the river gate that influenced the thinking for Bacchus because it was built with Bacchus in mind in terms of being able to allow, you never saw that kind of thing uh, before. And so the river gate influenced Bacchus. And then once you had the, the river gate, it was the way if you do the river gate, you can do it in the Superdome and you can do it in the convention center. And so the super crews were all influenced by the existence of those big buildings. And and those crews, uh, other than Bacchus, which doesn't have a, a queen or a court, that is a king or a god, uh, I, I'm thinking of Endymion, uh, they don't follow the tableau ball format, but they do have a, a king and a queen and a court, or maids at least, that aren't presented on stage, but are presented on floats. So it's still, this, that basic format is still good. Yeah. They do have a court, but they don't have all the, all, all the formality. I mean. Once they get done all that, it's really a big dance. Yeah, exactly. That's what it is. Something for everybody. Uh, Tracy, tell us a little bit about the original Illinois Club. And, uh, well, I don't want to give away the punchline about the special thing that, that you guys do each year. But give us a little bit of history and, and why uh, that group is so uh, essential to, I think, not only Mardi Gras history, but New Orleans history. Well, our club started in 1895. Uh, a guy who worked as a Pullman porter, his name was Wally Knight. He worked uh, on the Illinois Central Line that moved from New Orleans to Chicago. Most of the members of the early uh, original Illinois club were Pullman porters, and they were contributed to the middle class society in New Orleans and throughout the United States. Um, as far as the ball is concerned, our ball format is pretty much the same as, as most people, as most clubs with the debutante and the hierarchy, the, the king and the queen. But what Wally Knight did was he wanted to uh, elevate 
the young ladies and he wanted to show their accomplishments to society. But also he wanted to, he wanted to let everybody know that, uh, you know, you don't have to be unsophisticated in order to uh, have a good time. And today what we do is uh, we, we interview the young ladies back in September uh, to get them ready for the ball that's gonna be in February or early March. Um, we, we do a lot of uh, style, grace, uh, dance, and etiquette. <clears throat> we, we do this because we think it's important because getting back to what we talked about earlier on the balls, early on in, the, in, in New Orleans, the balls were, were, were really raunchy and the balls were not as nice as they are with the beautiful dresses and all. The balls were an opportunity for men and women to get together for whatever reason. And sometimes, sometimes it wasn't a, a good thing. You know, this, this, this location of our, our second uh, ballroom was in Storyville. And we, we to, the, the reason why we call it Storyville was because they wanted to shut the ballrooms down. The, the original ballroom, I think, was called the Globe. And it was somewhere on Decatur Street. And I think that one burned down. And, and it, it was a lot, of, a lot of bad things going on there. Um, that was an opportunity for, for white men to, uh, to date and to have um, a mixed race woman. It was difficult because it was socially acceptable at the time to have um, a wife and children, but also to have for lack of a better description, a side woman. And this was called a placage system. I don't know if you guys uh, uh, may pronounce it wrong, uh, placage or something like that. But it was socially acceptable for, for, for men to go out to these balls. And it wasn't very much money to get inside of a ball and to find uh, a concubine. So what, what my guy did, what Wally and I did, he tried to uh, flip, flip the script, if you will, and, and and make it something something nice, something uh, something appropriate, and at the same time highlight the achievement uh, of, of some of the, the black ladies. Because a lot of these these ladies who would go to the ball were able to read. They were they, they spoke two languages or sometimes more, and they were educated women, and they were looking to to better themselves in uh, in life. One of the elements that makes your ball so special um, is that very special dance that, that came from Chicago a while the night. He was a dance school instructor in addition to being a former uh, porter. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, that dance is called the Chicago Glide, and it's, it's hard as hell to remember, especially after about two glasses of champagne. But we do it every year, and we practice it. We practice it for about, about five weeks. You know the the waltz, the waltz, the history of the waltz is kind of kind of unique because uh, a long time ago the waltz was considered very risque. You know, at, at a long time ago, yeah, men and women did not face each other in close proximity mm -hmm. and hold on to each other and dance. You know, men dance with men and the women dance with uh, the women in a, in, a, in a straight line. When the waltz came about. You know, that was something that, uh, you know, was very, very stimulating. Your ball today is held at the General Hotel, right? 
we're doing it at the John Hotel this year. Who knows where we might be next year? Uh, hopefully, the, the, you know, the COVID virus will be under control by then. But we we started out at uh, at uh, can't think of the name of the place. Um, it's a, and we moved on to to the municipal auditorium, which uh, w- was great. You know, it was just a perfect setup for for the ball, and uh, it was big. It was you know mammoth in the sense that you know you can move all over the place and have a good time. Uh, May I ask a question, Arthur? Yes. Yeah. What caused the, uh, I guess, the division between the uh, Illinois Club and what became the Young Men's Illinois Club? That division came about somewhere in the mid 1920s, and for the life of me, I cannot figure it out. I had a club member who was 99 years old, and I asked him. He had been in the club for 40 years, and I asked him if he knew anything about it. He heard any rumors or anything like that. Um, he said he, he, he didn't know. I also asked uh, Lawrence Robinson, who's a member of the uh, Young Men Illinois Club, uh, he could, you know, shed some light on it. He didn't know what was going on. But there was a riff for some particular reason. I, I don't know why. But today, the Young Men Illinois Club members attend our ball and vice versa. You know, and we do honor their debutantes and we make sure that we, you know, have a gift for them and uh, we introduce them at our ball as well. Yeah. But we have, we have the same, we have the same mission, which is to, uh, to, uh, you know, highlight the young ladies and make, make sure that we show them in a positive, positive sense. Percy, I've shared this story with you before, but uh, about 20, 25 years ago, uh, Don Lee Kiku, who wrote for our publication and many others, we interviewed uh, Harold Bucher, who I think was a former mm. of the Illinois Club. There were several members there, and I'll never forget this. That we talked about the first time that they were uh, allowed to, to uh, stage a ball in the municipal auditorium, which had uh, been segregated. I don't remember the year, but though it doesn't matter. But they were supposed to allow the uh, whatever crew was staging the ball to get in at noon to do their setup and rehearsal when the ball was set at o'clock. And the uh, original Illinois club members got there at noon, places locked up, and they didn't open it until like about six o'clock. Ugh. And when they told me that story, I said, man, I'd have been, I'd have been so damn mad I want to burn the place down, you know, because obviously they knew what they were doing. They didn't want you there. And I remember <laughs> had a group who said, we did just the opposite. We left the place cleaner than we found it. <laughs> it's a book for you, great. Rather than being better, we'll show you. He said, man, the next year, <laughs> opened up where I was. everything was fine. But instead of getting mad, you know, I just thought it was a wonderful moment and, and handled uh, much more uh, delicately than I would have, you know, so. Uh, After that, that first place that we, we had the ball at, it was Rosenwald Gym. Yeah. Which I think yeah, I think it's located on Earhart and, and, uh, and what South Broad, something like that. Well, you got a lot of history, you really do. Well, let's let's talk to first about the uh, the history and importance of gay balls. And um, sadly, we don't have as many gay crews as we used to, and, and their membership is not as big, but it's certainly significant. Frank, what can you tell us? Well, uh, the phenomenon of gay carnival uh, began in 1958. Uh, and in the 1950s, there was a gentleman by the name of Doug Jones who lived on South Carrollton, and he would uh, always have a few of his gay friends over to watch the crew of Carrollton Parade because he was right on the parade route. And they did this every year uh, for a number of years, and then in 1958, decided to uh, add a touch of formality by forming a crew and naming a queen and uh, they call themselves the crew of Yuga. Uh, and Yuga is from Hindu mythology. Uh, and uh, Hindu heavens was the theme of a Proteus ball uh, some decades earlier. And Jones's family had had uh, connections to the crew of Proteus. So that may be where the name came from. Uh, but they were not really formal. They were more satirical in nature. They wanted to sort of poke fun at the seriousness with which the mainline older crews uh, take themselves. So instead of debutantes, they would have debut tramps. 
And the first two parties were just house parties where they would all come in drag or in costume and they would name a queen. Uh, to get back to your earlier question, Arthur, the, the popularity of the party grew exponentially and they needed by the third year a larger space. And they actually had their third ball at a jazz club on Lake Pontchartrain, which uh, apparently got really out of hand and they were not invited to come back. Uh, and so for the fourth year, they held their fourth ball at a place called the Rambler Room, which was a dance recital hall at an elementary school in Metairie. And that was sufficient uh, in terms of space. And they decided to do their fifth ball there in 1962. Uh, but that was a, a very ill-fated ball. Of course, being gay was not okay back then. And uh, at the fifth Yuga ball, the Jefferson Parish Police raided the place, arrested close to 100 men. There were a few that escaped. But that pretty much put an end to the crew of Yuga. Um, in 1961, the crew of Petronius was founded. They are still around. Uh, some of the other crews that formed in the 60s were Ganymede, Amun-Ra, Arminius, uh, uh, the crew of Apollo started 1970. And by the, by the 80s, uh, there were probably 17 or 18 different crews. None of them paraded, but all of them put on balls. And as far as ball locations, the very most of the balls in the 1960s and into the 70s took place at the International Longshoremen's Union Hall, which was a, a black labor union on Claiborne Avenue. Um, and that what that did was that provided enough space for more elaborate costume designs and set designs and what have you. Uh, by the 1980s, uh, most of the gay balls were held uh, down in Chalmette at the St. Bernard Civic uh, Center Auditorium. Uh, and I think it's important to remember the, that they're the, probably the biggest difference between the traditional old line crew balls and the gay balls are there's not so much a focus on presenting debutantes or that sort of thing. They're really elaborate drag shows. So think of a, think of a traditional parade, right? The captain selects the theme Every float is a variation on the theme, unless you have, you know, the standard floats in every parade. But with a gay ball, every costume that comes out is a variation on the theme that the captain selects. And most, they're very, very elaborate. And I think that's one of the things that makes these gay carnival crews so important, especially at that time when it was not so okay to be gay, was it provided a creative and artistic outlet for the for the gay community uh and uh, i would also point out that in all the years of gay carnival there's only been one lesbian crew the crew of ishtar of course nowadays the the gay crews and there are nine or ten still around uh are fully integrated uh, both racially as well as by gender but Tony, that's how it got started Tony is uh until we're celebrating its 60th anniversary this year which actually would have been a one a 21 but there were no functions then, so they're having a, a big anniversary. Uh, Frank, I'm sure you're familiar with this book. Let's see if I can hold it up. It's yes. By Howard Smith. Uh, it's called Unveiling the Muse, The Lost History of Gay Carnival in the Wall. Anybody who's interested in the subject, this is just absolutely phenomenal. It I mean, is. Isn't it terrific? I mean, yeah, it is an amazing book. Howard worked for, what, 15, 20 years on that book, and he and I are friends, and the book alone has over 600 illustrations, uh, weighs about 50 pounds, but it is absolutely amazing. Yeah, it, it's just, it's terrific. I've learned so much and I, I refer to it often. Uh, you and I talked last week about this, you know, St. Bernard, let's face it, then, and, and to some cases now, it's thought of as a rather uh, conservative community. And uh, according to Howard's book, the, the first ball, gay ball, was held in 1970. How did that... <laughs> The dichotomy. How does that? How did that work? <laughs> well, there there is some uh, some mythology involved with that, which is to say, nobody is for sure. Um, but as unwelcoming a place as Saint Bernard Parish may have been in in those years, uh, money talks, right? So, if the gay crews could fork up the money and come up with the money required, uh, that was an incentive for them. Uh, to go ahead and let the balls be held there. 
There's also a rumor that's never been verified that there was a St. Bernard politician who was blackmailed uh, for being in the closet into allowing this or enabling this to happen. Who knows? Uh, but there has there have always been a lot of drama with uh, with some of the gay balls. In fact, one of the uh, the, the Yuga raid that I mentioned from 1962, a lot of people assume it was just the Metairie Suburbanite housewives who called the police when they saw these drag queens pouring into the elementary school. But it's more likely, and Doug Jones, the founder of Yuga, and other members from that era believe that the police were tipped off by a disgruntled former member who had been expelled from the group, oh. a drag queen who was a, a bartender in the French Quarter. I mean, you know, I talked to a man one time who, uh, who worked in the construction of the St. Bernard Auditorium. And he told me, and this doesn't contradict what he said at all, that there were some things that they did with having those carnival balls in mind when they built it with the design that they were really thinking about being able to have those balls there because they'd heard and they'd known about what happened with the musical auditorium in New Orleans, how they were designed and left for two balls. And, and, and they designed that with, with the intention of being able to have those balls. Yeah, they certainly could. Um, and it, it certainly is large enough. I, I can tell you now, um, when you go to the, to the St. Bernard auditorium for a gay carnival ball, the floor is gonna be jam packed. There'll be tables everywhere. There are not quite as many people in the uh, in the stands or the seats on the balcony as there would have been, say, back in the 80s uh, and 90s. And most of the balls are still held there. The Lords of Leather meets at the Hilario Center in West Wego. And then in recent years, the crew of Armenius has moved back to New Orleans and is meeting at Mardi Gras World on the East Bank. Uh, but that St. Bernard Auditorium is huge. Isn't it true that probably half the audience is straight? that people uh, you know, find the tickets to see the, the glamour of a, a, a gay For party. sure. In, in the book that you uh, mentioned, Howard's book, he talks about back in the in the 80s, uh, uptown society matrons, you know, begging their hairdressers for invitations to these <laughs> these gay balls because a lot of times, it's important to remember that a lot of these, uh, these balls, the dates and locations and venues were kept secret until the day of because they were afraid that the police would raid them again. Changing times and, and for the better, we hope. <laughs> yes. I had some other uh, just topics I wanted to kick around here with, with all of you, please. And the um, the economics of, of this, you know, we, we know parades cost a lot of money to put on, but, but so do balls. And when you think about, you know, lighting and scenery and flowers and, and all rental and uh, it's impossible to measure, but, but there's a lot of money spent not just to present the ball, but to attend the ball. I mean, they're, they're sure. pairs, and, and I'm talking about all balls, but particularly traditional balls. You know, you have to dress up to go to these things. Hairdressers, uh, taxi service, Uber, whatever. You got to get there. You have to eat. I mean, uh, I, I wish we had a, a better feeling for the economic impact. Uh, Victor Andrews and I, a couple of years ago, for the for my Mardi Gras, I Victor works in the advocate for community surveyed about 33 different, uh, I think it's 33 uh, traditional ball balls, crews that don't also parade. And of course, they're all in between, but we, we totaled up, there were 30, uh, 314 maids, 122 ladies in waiting and 120 pages. And each one of those has a costume of, of some sort on, or a fancy dress. And you know, how much, how much is spent on that? It, it has to be an enormous amount. And it's a party we give for ourselves when you think about it and, and the invited guests. It's, it's like almost a, a reunion type celebration. And, you know, you just wonder, why do we do this? You know, I think we do it <laughs> we like to celebrate, but as an economic, as a business plan or an economic model, none of it makes sense, including parading. You know, you pay dues for the privilege of hiding your face behind a mask and you give thousands of dollars worth of goodies away to find it. Who does that? <laughs> we do. But, you know, also, also, there's a there's a whole lot of money that's spent on the debutante parties, which lead up to the ball. Too. Right. And and there are tons of those starting in the summer. Right. And of course, the people again. It's not just the people on stage. The people who attend. You can't be mm -hmm. seen in the same dress. And we got it easy. Wear the same tuxedo. 
But ladies right. are not going to be seen in the same dress at five different debutante parties. I mean, we're the formal wear capital of the world every year in, in uh, January and February. It's, uh, it's, it's just an amazing thing that we do here. And I hope, I hope it never changes. There's another aspect about balls, um, memorabilia, things that are created for a ball. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's a one-time thing. It happens. It's, it's gone. Um, ephemeral, I guess you'd say, but when I collect ball programs because they have a lot of information in them, uh, crew favors, uh, invitations, dance cards. There's a whole category of memorabilia associated with, and it's good to see some of the crews going back to the 1800 style of die cut invitations and things and admit cards. And uh, again, it's, it's a whole separate industry, but uh, you know, I, I look back at some of these things. I have the second Thomas Ball program from 1858, and I wonder about how was that event? You know, how did people get there? Obviously, not by street ball, but by carriage, I guess. And and I also wonder where has this piece of paper been since 1858? How many hands have held it? You know, it's just uh, it's a one night event, but in, in a lot of ways, it's kind of forever. And I'm, I'm glad we have these mementos to, to say. Arthur, we, we, we're in touch with Amistad, which is at Tulane University right now. And uh, just like everybody else in Hurricane Katrina, we took a terrible hit with our archives. And Amistad was really good about coming out in the summertime and helping us go through all of this. Mm -hmm. And uh, they took a tremendous amount of our, our history and, uh, and fixed it up, you know, repurposed it. And, cleaned it up real good for us now. And so whenever we needed to make a presentation at a ball, uh, you know, we just get in touch with them and, and it's been wonderful for us. It's so important. I, I donated all of my African-American uh, memorabilia to them, Don Stein, and Loyola University, my college alma mater, their library had nothing from Mardi Gras. So I had a, a collection of about 2,500 ball programs from 19, well, right after World War II up to the present day. And they're all housed there. And, you know, None of us own this stuff. We're just custodians so somebody else gets it. So I didn't want to see this stuff wind up in a garbage bin or a garage sale. But we need to we need to save this these things. And yeah. uh, you, you don't I mean they're not valuable. If you, if you buy one, it's you know, three dollars in a garage sale. But they're important, you know. They they are. Um and, and along those lines, I, I would if I could just point out, um I do a lot of work with the LGBT plus archives project. Uh, we don't operate a repository, but we connect donors with institutions, whether it's Amistad, the Historic New Orleans Collection, the State Museum, you name it. And uh, we encourage people all the time, if you go to a ball, save your program, save your invite, whatever it may be, and let's get that to where it can be preserved. Because, you know, 100 years from now, we want researchers and, and Mardi Gras enthusiasts to have things to look at and study. And thankfully, we have places like this, Fort Worth, like Tulane, Louisiana State Museum, that are happy to, to receive these things. You you see ball programs just left on the floor. I don't care, and but we care, and it's it's history. And uh, I'm glad places like HNOC are, are preserving it, and not just preserving it, but making it available to not only scholars but to regular folks who just want to come in and and see, hey, I heard my, my grandmother was in the court of Venus in 1949. Well, how do you document that? Well, you go to a place like HMOC or the other place you mentioned, and, and uh, there's a good chance I can help you with that. I'm hoping we're going to have a safe and wonderful carnival season. I don't think there's ever been a more anticipated one. Right. Let's hope we all can enjoy it safely. And uh, I think we're about out of time. This has been a lot of fun. There'll, there'll be other sessions available to everybody. and. Uh, if you haven't seen the exhibit at the HNOC, get down there because it is spectacular. It's going to be up for several months. But why wait? Come on down and see what we have. And uh, on behalf of our panel, I want to wish everybody a very happy and safe Mardi Gras. Same to you. Thank you.